Hi everybody, my name is Antoinette and this is Good Owl Games and welcome to March's monthly roundup video. I've played some amazing games this month and I absolutely can't wait to share them with you. So let's get this thing started. <laughs> So March has been a bit of a steamroller for games, to be honest, because um, for the past while, it's kind of like buses where you've been waiting and waiting for ages for something exciting to play. And then all of a sudden they all happen at once. So, yeah, this is a pretty epic video and I've got to play some really, really great games. Um, and for those of you who don't know what this video is about, hello, welcome, where have you been? Um, this is the video where I talk about the games I've been playing over the past month. So that's often new things in my collection, some of my own games I've been playing, sometimes trades and stuff like that. And as always, I encourage you at home to tell us what you've been playing, what's been your favourite thing the past month. Um, I love getting ideas and inspiration for further purchases from um, you lovely fellows in the comments. Um, so I guess I should jump right in. Actually, the one thing I should explain before I start is that I kind of have three sections. So first off, we'll talk about new games I've acquired. Um, second off, I actually had a trade this month, so I'll put in the trade section for fun. And then I'll talk about some games I've been playing. And then right at the end, I shove in a little personal bit if you want to hear about what's been going on with me and the channel and all those stuff. And of course, I'll put the little time stampy things in the bottom so you can hop around as you so wish. But of course, I would love you to stay for the whole video because, you know, that would be cool and while i'm here why not subscribe to the channel if you're into board games and you want to hear about more of them because that's what i do here all right so let's start at the very very beginning of the month and it feels incredibly long ago now actually and i'm going to talk about imperial steam and i've mentioned this in previous monthly roundup videos because i was so so excited and um, this comes from capstone games it comes from the same designer who made lignum and i absolutely love Lig lignum and imperials um i want to call it imperial spells and steam which is a completely different game that i also own please forgive me for being confused but imperial steam is a train game um and much like other train games this is one about creating routes and making money and so when i heard about this i was like this is great i love a good train game i love a good finance game so this should be really entertaining um, and so you get this big, beautiful board. Um, there's quite a few pieces going on. Things are nice and colorful. And really what the game seems to be about is connecting as many places as possible. But to get to places, you're going to need resources to build railway tracks. Makes sense. How do you get the resources from the railway tracks? Well, you got to build factories to get the resources. So it's that kind of thing. And then whoever has the most money at the end emerges victorious. What I found unusual about this is the fact that one of the goals of the game is to get to a particular location and there is a bonus for getting there first. But beyond that, if nobody decides to do it, you can just kind of play on as you will. That's how the, the game ends. Um, on the surface, I suppose I should really have loved this. Um, this is kind of all sorts of things I like doing. So it's really action, action selection. So there was a whole host of actions you could choose from. So whether you wanted to get workers, you know, to be able to build, build factories, build railroads, you need people to be able to put out there. Um, and yeah, it's all about kind of managing your actions versus your money and where you're going and things like that. It just didn't really sing for me. I think some of it just didn't click in the way I had hoped. Um, the fact you can only choose, you know, one particular action to do a turn um, kind of, I don't know, fragmented it a little bit for me. The actions didn't feel like they really super went together. They were more necessities. Like they weren't fun um, ways to try things out. I found it very unusual that, you know, to build a railroad track, you needed a bit of everything. You needed all of the goods available. Meaning you can never really specialize um, when it comes to things like factories, which make the goods. Meaning to build a railroad track, you had to have a factory essentially of each type. And sure, you can buy goods, but you had to plan that a turn in advance. Um, and things are expensive when you're trying to make money. I was really disappointed by the fact that the factories are finite resources. So they are as big as you make them initially. And every time you take a resource away, that's all the resources they had. Um, so they didn't continually make things. And to me, that didn't make a whole bunch of sense. I don't know. I, yeah, um, sure, I was let down. Um, but you know what? I think this might not just be my jam which is both surprising and disappointing. And I do think maybe I put a lot of pressure on this title because I was so eager to try it out. Because, um, yeah, I waited ages to do this, to do this thing. And 
even after the first play, and we felt like, God, it felt like we were, I was missing something. So we looked up some more rules and we checked things. And we went back and played it again. And it still didn't feel kind of that kind of spark like I would have hoped. So Imperial Steam, not for me, maybe for other people. Maybe those people who are really into the 18xx games will appreciate this a little bit more. Like, I, yeah, there was lo just lots of this that just didn't make logical sense to me to put together. Um, like I said, maybe I'm missing something. But yeah, so that was Imperial um, Steam. Um, beautiful game, possibly interesting to you, less so to me. So number two on my agenda of new games is one that's been out for a while. I'd heard a lot about, but didn't really think it was going to be something that I don't know I would like but I do have a tendency um to buy a game even if I'm not sure I like it or not to give it a try if I you know see enough people playing it or I hear enough about it and so this one is Lost Runes of Arnak um so yeah I'm sure tons of you have heard about this before now like I'm jumping late on the hype train um and this is a game about exploration really you have landed on an uninhabited island and you're exploring kind of like Indiana Jones where you're looking for relics and artifacts you're fighting mythical beasts and you're exploring the land um I really hadn't expected much from this I'll be very honest and I was super duper surprised um this is a very fun I, I don't want to call it like what well, maybe it is worker placement but it's not it's a lot of things right but um how the game works is that you have a deck of cards and these represent kind of your resources and things like that um you are able to purchase cards to add to your deck of cards so there's a little bit of deck building you have meeples who can go places on the board to get your resources so that you can go either fight monsters you can do research as well um, which gives you kind of resources and things and if you get to the top of that track there are some big bonuses to be had um, but mostly the fun here is kind of combining your things together um, I really enjoyed the items and the, the artifacts that you pick up and put in your deck some of these were really really fun and really really cool um, and ways to do like additional things it's one of those where if I get to this I can do this I can maybe do this you know um, it's just had a really good feel about it um yeah I really really like this one um yeah the cards were great and I'm quite picky about cards um I thought finding the monsters was actually fun because you just hand in resources and then you would have like a new place you could go and visit as you explore the board um I'm still raging I've never quite made it to the top of kind of the research track so I can have the expensive items the game is played over five rounds and they go lightning fast so fast I don't think I've ever prepared myself for the final round I actually had a lot of fun playing this game with a friend of mine, Quaid Rain, on Twitch um, for St. Patrick's Day, us both being Irish, um, where I actually taught this game live, what was I thinking? And then we proceeded to play a game over Board Game Arena. So if you're into Twitch and you like board games and possibly baking and cooking, um, you should definitely go and check that stuff out. Um, but it was it was fun. Um, it's interesting teaching a game, actually. I'm just gonna decide to jump into that for the first time in ages. Normally my husband does the teaches, so I did a lot of prep work so that I could teach it, teach it in a logical order so that it would make sense, not giving too much information away at the start. And then the minute I started talking, all of that went out of my head. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty awful. Um, but it was fun to play it with somebody else. And it's also the first time I think really, I've, I don't normally play games online with other people. So this was a new experience for me as well. And I have to say Board Game Arena did a really good job with Lost Ruins. So yeah, absolutely love this game. Um, I already want the expansion. I don't know if any of you guys have got it yet. Um, so the expansion comes with new leaders and all sorts of things that you can do ever so slightly differently while still having the same game. Um, but I would highly recommend this. I've replayed it a number of times already. It's quite quick. It doesn't even take that long to play. And it's just kind of fun and easy going. And sometimes, you know, I forget that board games can be about that. They don't always have to be about the stern puzzle or, you know, having to work everything out to the maximum. Sometimes you can just enjoy yourself too. And I think this is a great example of just a fun game that has some great mechanics behind it. Um, so yeah, really, really enjoyed um, Lost Runes of Arnak. You should definitely check that out. So this is the part where the plot thickens. I have a friend 
who we play board games with, who is a big fan of Uwe Rosenberg games, but also Roll and Write games. Meaning I get to try a lot of Roll and Write games that I would never keep or play for myself because I, I don't really enjoy the genre. It always feels like a, a solo game to me. So I've played a couple of different things, um, but none of them have really stuck up until recently. Um, so I got to try Cartographers from Thunderworks Games. And yet again, I am late to this party, but here we go. It's a kind of, it's a flip and write, not necessarily a roll and write or roll, flip and draw, I want to call it that. And Cartographers is a game about, well, making a map. Um, and this, this really surprised me. Um, I don't know if it's just that I like coloring in or that I like board games or what, but this feels different to other um, roll and write games to me. Um, so how the game works is you start with a little grid, it's a, it's a map of sorts, and you're going to fill it in with different terrain types. Um, the terrain types you're getting are revealed at the start of each turn um, and they come in like Tetris pieces. So um, you'll have to make them fit on your map. Um, there are objectives to be met um, and they will score um, at different times during the game, a little like Isle of Sky if you're familiar with that. Um, and you have to make everything fit and colour everything in um, to try and fill out the board as efficiently as possible while getting as many rewards as possible. Um, so there, yeah, there are different terrain types. You might also come across a monster. There are temples to be dealt with and little mountains. There is a more difficult side also to your piece of paper, which I've not ventured to yet because I'm still understanding shapes. Um, and this is probably why um, games like this normally don't go well with me. I have like spatial relation problems where I can't, I can't picture where everything is going to fit. Um, but because these are on a card, I'm able to pick up the card and kind of dry fit things on my board as it were to see if they fit. Um, I really, really enjoy cartographers. Um, and I think the part of it is, yes, there's the Tetris puzzle portion. Yes, there is the coloring in portion. So like, you know, I was drawing in my trees in green and, and also the fact that at the end of the game, you end up with this beautiful board that you have created all by yourself. But also I think the scoring mechanisms, mechanisms are very interesting. You, you know, there are different ways to approach each game. I wondered, would it become very samey, you know, just trying to fit pieces around things? Um, but not the case. Um, I, this is just lovely. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, I've taken to playing this, you know, with a cup of tea before bed at night because it is that kind of soothing thing. And I think if you thought, you know, adult colouring books were too intricate for you, I would highly recommend this because um, it gave me that kind of feeling of... Um, coloring but with a purpose <laughs> and like i said there's a very solid game here too um but it's simple and fun you can play it with a couple of different people there is some interactive aspects as well so if a monster attacks you you'll have to pass your map to somebody else and they'll draw the monster on your map it's horrible but of course you get to draw the monster on someone else's map so maybe that levels it out i don't know i hate when people mess with my lovely shapes um, but yeah, I super, super enjoyed this. Um, so I enjoyed it so much in my first play that we bought our own copy of Cartographers within a day or two after that. And I've been coloring happily away and puzzling out ever since. And I've even managed to win a game. So I'm very chuffed about that. Because this is the kind of game where I'm not sure how much it matters that you win. Because sometimes the journey is really the fun bit. And I like the I like the puzzle of trying to make everything fit and make it look pretty and wish I had nicer markers. I finally found a use for my art supplies. Yeah, so this game is a winner all around for me. Super impressed with this. Like I said, I've had some very impressive games this month. And this is definitely well up there with them. And it's definitely a surprise. I hate roll and writes. Maybe I've been wrong all this time. Do you have a favourite roll and write or flip and write that I should be checking out? I, I've tried Welcome to um i'm trying to i've played ranch i've played i've played a couple of them i think well ganshun clever and quicks i think is the other one i'm trying to remember the other one on my phone so there's a couple of them i've tried but none of them stuck like this i think this is special um maybe it needs its own category right okay so what's next on the agenda okay let's keep this show on the road with the next utterly surprising, absolutely brilliant game um, I've gotten in the past month. And this is, and I'm not sure how well to pronounce this, Nidava, Nidvillier, I'm calling it Nidvillier. I've heard it Nidavellier as well. I don't know, it's, it's, it's this one, Nidavellier. And what, what made me dubious about this is the fact that this is a bidding game. And maybe some of you at home will have experienced this issue, which is that with two players, bidding games can be a bit crap. 
um, because normally, you know, when you're bidding one v one, there's yeah, it's not it's not good. Some mechanics just don't work well with few players, and I always think bidding ones or auction ones, they got issues. Um, this game has done something very very special indeed, and it's made bidding fun for two. And what you're doing in Nidavellir, <laughs> Nidavellir, um, this is a game about recruiting dwarves to your party, and you do this by going to the inn and kind of bidding on them or offering them a certain amount of gold to come and join your party. Um, what it's really about is bidding and set collection because each of these dwarves have a different colour and each colour dwarves set of them will score differently. So for instance the more green ones you have the more points they are. Um, the purple ones are similar they have a chart as well for how many you own. The blue ones are just worth the victory points on them. The warriors which are the red ones are worth, as, um, worth all of their points but also if you have the most of them you um, get to score your highest coin, that kind of stuff. I'll get coins in a second. So yeah, there's these dwarves you're collecting and you're wanting to recruit them. And how it works is that they're in different taverns and secretly at the start of the round, you make a bid with your coins um, for dwarves in the taverns. Now, normally I don't feel like this works, but here's the trick with this one. So you both flip up your coin and reveal who has bid what. The winner gets first pick of the, well, three dwarves and two players anyway. Um, and then the second player gets to pick another dwarf, right? So you're never left out, which is, I thought was really, really cool. Um, the fun part about this game is that there is a coin that allows you to upgrade your coin to make it better. So you, if you have a three coin and a five coin, you could make it into an eight coin, giving you a better chance at bidding, you know, on all these dwarves in the middle. Um, but also your coin is like worth victory points at the end of the game as well. Um, there are prizes for um, having the most of a particular color of dwarf by a particular point in the game. And I really like those. All of those prizes are worth fighting for, I tell you. Um, but what I love about this game is that I never feel left out. And you can go many strategies, because that was terrible English, wasn't it? There are many strategies um, you can go down. No, that also doesn't sound right. Okay, there's lots of things you can do here to try and win. And I feel like I try something a little bit different every time I play. So at one point I was like, I'm just gonna get all the dwarves that are worth loads of points, right? We'll go down that route. Different time I was like, I'm gonna upgrade all my coins and have the most coins worth of stuff. Um, another time it was like, I'm just gonna take any dwarf that's available and just put as many dwarves into play as possible and ignore, you know, kind of, and not gonna put any strictures on them. I'm just gonna take, leftovers or one time I didn't upgrade my coins at all just to see how it went and I'm amazed that there's so much to be thought about in such a simple game um, definitely at two players anyway there's a lot of thinking about well they're going to want this colour dwarf so that means I'm definitely going to get that so I don't need to bid as high a coin on that um, this is definitely kind of diluted with more players I did actually get to try it with four people isn't that magical um, and it was much more of a kind of like a scramble um, to see what you could get um, but it was also interesting too, um, like it was definitely less focused, but still kind of fun, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm super, super impressed with this. Um, I don't know why I didn't pick it up sooner. I think it was listed for a, like a spiel or was nominated or something like that at one point. And I completely understand why. This is an absolutely fantastic game. And it seems to get better the more of it um, that I play. Um, we liked it so much that I've already got the expansion, which is called Thing Valir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in the expansion, there are cards that you can use for both color type of dwarves, which I thought was really interesting. But what I didn't discover up until the point where you play it is how these multicolored dwarves kind of work is that if you win the bid in a particular tavern, you can choose instead to take one of these cool, fancy new dwarves from like a different area um, and you can take them, but they don't go into play right away. They can, they go into play at like the end of the round, meaning you get to decide what color they are later but also means you lose out on the benefit of playing them immediately and instantly I was horrified I was like because if you get one of each color dwarf into play you can get a fancy special dwarf right so you want to kind of combo those out sometimes um, but the problem with these two color ones is that well if I 
I take it now. It doesn't go into play immediately, so you're losing out. But it might be better later. Um, it made for some very interesting um, thought experiments, I suppose. And there was all kind of cool artifacts and things in there as well that I felt were really nice in the game. Um, it definitely added a different dimension to it without completely like straying from it. Um, I can't recommend thing Valir highly enough. I can't find a thing wrong with it or Nid Valir either, all the Valirs. Um, yeah, absolute fan of this. And it's just so easy to teach and fun to play. And it's quick as well. This game doesn't take more than like half an hour if even that um, so you want to bang out a couple of games together it comes with a rack to put your coins in I would have loved if the coins were kind of something more than the cardboard because you use the coins a lot so it would have been cool if they were something a little bit more durable but you know I can't complain the price the price of this game was so reasonable yeah it was all good stuff so yeah definitely excited about that god I'd love I'm just sitting here going god, <laughs> I want to do this the next time I play um, and it is just that type of game all right, so going to roll all to the next one um, in the sake of time and effort. Yeah, I know, there's a lot to go through, people. I told you, it's like trains or buses, loads of them all at once. Um, okay, so next on the agenda is one I, you might have heard about if you, or I don't know, look into board games online. I, I assume some of you do. And this is Furnace from Hobby World. So Furnace, there was a big hubbub about it, like um, the last time we had a convention. <laughs> Feels like forever ago now. Um, and lots of people were talking about it and then it just seemed to be like unobtainium. You just couldn't find it anywhere. And recently it came into stock in my local board game shop, which isn't really local, but it's definitely my board game shop. So this is Happy Go Lucky in Clon and Kilty. I have to give them a shout out because I feel like I've bought all of their new stock in the past month. They have a website if for some reason you'd like to order some board games in Ireland you should definitely check them out um, so I was super excited to see they had furnace I was like oh my god furnace um, and we got it home and so what I learned about furnace before just before I opened the box is furnace is also a bidding game I was like oh you're kidding me but so many people have been talking about it um, and they didn't seem to be like group plays so I'm like maybe there's something to this so allow me to impress upon you how good a bidding game this is so you think Ting Valir is good this I keep calling it Thing Valir. It's Nid Valir. Thing Valir is the expansion. So Nid Valir is good. Um, Furnace takes this to, yeah, a whole other level. This is definitely much more of a strategic game, but not too much. So here, well, what's the plot of Furnace? Um, I believe we're in industrialists. And it, to me, the, the game seems to go, you get the coal to get the iron bars. You get the iron bars to go and get the oil drums. And then you get the oil drums to get the victory. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, how it works is that you have buildings and these will have kind of um, statements upon them or, if, or actions upon them. So it'll be like trade two coal to get a metal bar, you know, trade four metal bars to get four victory points, that kind of stuff. They're all kind of, I want to call them limits, but I don't think they are that. Um, so the, what, okay, so, <laughs> so what you're doing is you are gathering these buildings with their locations kind of that have these different instructions upon them and then you're going to run them so that you will get all the resources be able to spend the resources to get yourself victory points you start with your own um, place and there are powers you can play with as well there are individual people those are all busted by the way they're brilliant all of them have some really cool ability i have not been disappointed by any of them yet if anything i've been like i think these might be very strong um, but for your initial game anyway, well, how this works is that there will be a row of buildings for you to choose from and you have four discs to place out numbered one to four and that's kind of the strength of your bid. So your four is your highest number and in turn you'll place your number um, out on whichever kind of building it is you want to put into your tableau. Um, so the fun part here is that um, fours will win, but you can't put in the same number on any of the spaces, right? Um, but if you don't win, you, there is a consolation prize on each card. And how much of that you get is determined by how high your bid was. So let's say you don't win the card, but you come second with a three and the card says you can get two coal. Well, actually you're gonna get six coal because your second bid was a three. So you bid your way down the line with these discs. Um, and there's a lot of thought to be put into them because as they're resolved, um, certain ones will happen immediately. The consolation prizes happen straight away. Um, and some of those will be kind of conversion things as well. So you kind of need to be prepared for that. What's fascinating about this is that at two players, you play with a dummy player. 
and it's very very clever i normally hate a dummy player but this one's very good where you roll the dice and you place out their disc um, wherever it's possible and they will bid from one to four and you know in what order so you can kind of guess what they're going to end up because you can't end up with the same numbers in the same places at least from the the same colors um so then you take your cards back then you organize them whichever way you want and you can use them whatever way you want the game is played over four rounds and they are fast, really, really fast. And you're just basically trying to find uses for all of your resources and make sure you have enough resources to turn them into things. Um, and that is Furnace. Um, this is this is outstanding. I think it's really worth it. I've never played a bidding game like it. I love the consolation prize mechanism. I never felt left out. Oftentimes you didn't want to win things because the consolation prize was better. And so people were trying not to win stuff while also winning stuff or convincing the AI that they wanted to win stuff. Um, it was just super impressive. Um, I had so much fun with it and it's quick as well. I think for me what makes Furnace really really fun is that you can see everything unfolding in front of you and actually physically manipulate things. So I enjoyed being able to let's say place, um, reorganize my cards in what order I thought I was going to resolve them. I could flip them around, things like that. I could leave resources on cards that I was going to pay for them later. I, I liked it un unfurling. Um, in real time in your own way. Um, there are ways to upgrade cards as well, but you're not always going to want to do that. Um, you just, sometimes you just want victory points. Um, and uh, I don't know how else to I, like, I guess the best part of this is the turning things into things and doing it the best way you possibly can. And I knew the minute we opened the box and I saw the first couple of cards, I was like, that. That is the kind of thing that I am into. And I just, yeah, I just, it's just very chill. It is strategic, but not like, it's not heavy, if that makes sense. Um, but it's very fun. And the bidding part, oh, it's so good. So good. Like, I can't believe I found two bidding games in one month that are both just outstanding. I don't know. I, I love that board game designers are finding new ways to do old mechanics um, to make them more interesting, I suppose, to a modern audience. I think this is fab. I really hope we see more stuff like this in the future where mechanics I kind of written off for myself are being reinvented and are now suddenly really fun to play with. So I super enjoyed Furnace. Um, very overproduced, by the way. It's in a box that's far too big for it. But you know what? I just, I just don't, I just, <laughs> I just don't care. It was just that fun. Um, so that is Furnace, everybody. Um, definitely check that out if you can get a, a hold of a copy of it. It's nice to see it coming back into print again. Um, and the final game I'm going to talk about just landed yesterday. So I can't even tell you that much about it, but this is just like foreshadowing, I suppose, to next month. And this is, to give it its full title, is... Wu Wei Journey of the Changing Paths and this is from Grey Wolf Games and what I can tell you about it so far is it it seems to be some sort of kind of abstract game about employing kind of Taoism or Taoism of the way of the Tao um, but inside of the box is the most like ridiculously top-notch production I've ever seen of anything. It's got these huge chunky kind of plastic pieces. It's got really fancy unique dice. It's got this cool kind of recess board. Um, I'm really looking forward to digging my teeth into it. It is a, um, a very beautiful game. So I'm, I'll be back with more info about that soon. The short, sadly, it's just landed. So that's on next month's list. But aren't you glad I've another no other new games to talk about? Like I have to be read in the face by now i've been talking so long um but yeah i have one more game to talk about but that's in the trade section i can't believe i'm having a trading moment this is so exciting all right let's pop to there and of course we can't forget about cryptid urban legends um so yeah i reviewed cryptid some time ago you could go and check that out it is a deduction game you need at least three players to play and in it you are tracking down this cryptid kind of this this bigfoot type thing and you're doing it by asking questions of the other players you have with you um, and from there you're kind of deducing information until you have an answer um, that was another kind of surprise game for me because that should be something my brain doesn't compute very well but i really liked cryptid i was a big fan of it um, so now there is a cryptid two-player only version the uh, um, urban legends now this is interesting um it's not like cryptid um i think that was a bit of a a hurdle for it to begin with by giving itself that name sure it's similar in the sense that 
Um, there, you are tracking down a cryptid if you play as the scientist, but if you're, you can also play as the cryptid who is trying to avoid the scientist. And this went from being a deduction game where you're reading sentences as your clues um, to basically being a puzzle game of sort where you were trying to trap your opponent um, using coloured cubes. Um, and how the game works is that there is basically a row of cards and a number of cubes of different colours. And what you're doing is, as actually technically well as either side I'll start with the scientist right so you're trying to track down the cryptid um, you placing out these cubes onto the next row of cards right from one to the other you use your cards to do this they'll like do things like split or um, they'll do um, basically ways to move the cubes onto the other row and you want to move them in such a way that the cryptid can't have presence so how the cryptid has presence is basically by being able to see patterns in the cubes you've placed out so this means, for example, if the cryptid says two red, um, that means anywhere that has two red cubes next to it, the cryptid can have presence. So what you're trying to do is break them up in such a way that the cryptid can't say this. Um, and the cryptid wins if they win, if they control either end of their row of cards, like they so they can escape. Um, there's more to it than that, obviously, but um, this is just kind of a quick overview. I have a full review coming soon. Um, yeah, this is just a very different kettle of fish than Cryptid, and I think it surprised me. It's the type of game that hurts my head a lot. It reminds me of chess, because this isn't the game where your moves are for your benefit. They are rather to the detriment of somebody else, for the most part. So you're trying to prevent the Cryptid from doing something. The Cryptid, who is trying to prevent the scientist from doing such and such um, and that seems to be kind of the main focus here um, it's definitely very thinky and quite strategic and it changes you know every turn because you can both move the cubes to try and align things up um, that might be your jam I think there are a lot of people who enjoy those type of kind of cat and mouse games because it has that feel wasn't you know a big hit for me but that's just because I think I was well I mean I wasn't just expecting something else but it's a different style of game and it's normally something I wouldn't play mostly because um I like we're very unbalanced here and that kind of thought in my house my husband plays chess he can think very strategically like he can think turns ahead in ways that I don't um, I don't feel like I can do so it's very hard to keep up with them so we never feel evenly matched I think if I were to play with somebody else it wouldn't be such a big deal but uh, you know this is what I got um, and I got to work with it so I think if you like that kind of puzzle then this should be your thing and as I said full review coming soon you can check that out but isn't it cool that Cryptid has a two-player version I just I wish it was more cryptid-y <laughs> cool all right all right, so this bit is probably going to make me giggle because I, f I kind of find this whole trade um, hilarious. Um, so as many of you may remember some moons ago, I reviewed a game called Tapestry and its expansion, Plans and Employees. And I was really torn about Tapestry in particular um, because Tapestry called itself a civilization game, but really it's a game about going up tracks and kind of upgrading things and that um, like the civilization theme just didn't really hang together it was just you know bits of things that people have done and I remember at the time I played a lot of it because I was so uncertain how I felt about it I think I wanted to feel a particular way um, but actually it was still quite fun to play even though it wasn't the thing I suppose I kind of hoped it was um, and every so often we always we have the debate here in the house of you know oh if you could get one game back that we sold or got rid of or moved on whatever you want to say you know when you have to clear out your games because there just ain't enough space to keep everything um, we moved on Tapestry some time ago now and the, and <laughs> and its expansion um, and it's the one that I always wondered should we have kept um, Tapestry is just the type of game that keeps me wondering. So uh, we were just discussing that, you know, like a week or so ago, and I was like, it's probably Tapestry if there's a game I wish maybe we kept longer. So we put it up on our for trade. You know, we, we'd like to, like to get Tapestry back. And sure enough, we traded back for Tapestry. Um, and it came back sleeved. Woo! Got a much better version than I, than I had originally. Um, and I traded this away for Bonfire and a copy of Ares Expedition. So... Um, Bonfire, you might know, is that Stefan Fell game that 
just didn't didn't hit the mark for me um no yeah I ju it just didn't I stayed on my shelf for so long because I was like I'll definitely play another game of bonfire it just never happened it just wasn't appealing enough um and the terraforming Mars Ares expedition was more of a case of we played it a lot but found it um a little stale or a little clinical I think is the word I used at the time because it was missing some of that wacky crazy stuff the terraforming Mars likes to throw at you um it was all very very mild mannered and I was like I think I'd just rather play Terraforming Mars so quite happy to move those on let someone else enjoy them they're both pretty good games um but yeah Tapestry made its way back um so this is the third game ever in my collection to have left and returned the first was Carcassonne well I used to have Carcassonne when it first came out and then it got moved on at some point you know and you're doing your clear outs and then I think it must have been a couple of Christmases ago and I was super depressed and I'm like, I just want to play tiles like in Carcassonne. So there you go, ended up with Carcassonne. Root is game number two to have left my collection and returned. Um, Root was the game when it first came out, we got a copy, everyone was super excited, we were super excited. It was very um, clunky with two. I liked it, my husband not so much, so there was no point in keeping a game that no one was gonna play with me. So I moved it on and we got it back and love it, absolutely love it. I think that time apart from Root, helped it helped our relationship a lot to be honest we had to go see other people do other things the timing maybe just wasn't right um but i'm delighted to have it back it's it's got a lot of plays into it now actually i'm very very fond of fruit i think yet again that might have been a game of expectations where you are expecting it to do one thing but really it does something very different and now i can kind of accept it for who it is and enjoy that right so that's right so the third then now is tapestry um and so i gave it a go um last week when it came back because i was like ah will you look we'll have to check everything's in here we'll we'll give it a go and nothing really has changed tapestry is still a game about going up tracks and I think as long as you don't expect more than that from it, you won't be disappointed. Um, I do think the expansion adds a lot. Um, I remember feeling that at the time as well, that you'd, I think you'd want to play with the expansion. The Plans and Ploys one is particularly good. And there's a new expansion having come out since. I haven't looked at yet. So that's on the agenda. That's the Architects or Artisans or something like that. It's definitely got art in the title. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But there, I completely forgot just how big Tapestry is. Oh my gosh. Like we were there pulling stuff out of the box forever. You can say one thing for Stonemaier games is that you get some a lot of fancy stuff in your boxes. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was nice to go back to it. I think it has a place. I think it has a place where I don't want to think and I just want to move things around and put the pretty buildings out. Um, so for instance, slightly like cartographers, because I was tempted to start colouring this in, you have a little um, board and you're trying to fit your buildings onto it they're like tetra shaped pieces um, and you want to fill out the lines and grids as much as possible um, so I really like that portion of it I do like going up tracks I'm totally fine with that um, so yeah so it's kind of it's I'm surprised it's back but I'm also glad I'll see um, how I feel about it in a month or two and see if I've played it again since who knows what will happen um, so yeah so that was my one trade of the month has anyone else managed to trade anything I, I blame all sorts of reasons why it's difficult and expensive to trade nowadays when it used to be um, but I always think it's a great way of getting new games I have no problem about secondhand stuff all on that um, I don't mind stuff kind of that that's been used or played with I don't need anything pristine as long as the game's still there and it functions I'm pretty happy with that um so yeah all right so that's kind of all the games um i've gotten this month <laughs> yeah i know it looks bad but i'm sure next month will be somehow barren um but i want to hear about what you've been picking up and then i'm very quickly going to tell you about one game i've been playing because this video is becoming ever more verbose and bigger and larger and i don't know if necessarily better um the more i talk so i'll pop into something surprising that happened to me next and let's go to be fair, you've heard pretty much about most of the games I've been playing this month. Sure, there are a couple of others I could mention, but um, I had something kind of unusual happen. Um, so I thought I would talk about this game because I've never talked about it really before. I don't think I have at all. Um, some of you will have heard of it. Some of you will hate it. Maybe some of you played it. Maybe some of you gave it up. Um, this is Magic the Gathering, the collectible card game. <laughs> so it's probably something you've heard of if you're into any sort of games really at all, isn't it? It's kind of like the grandfather of 
of CCGs. I think it's the longest running CCG in the world, a long collectible card game. But for those of you who aren't familiar with Magic the Gathering, um, allow me to enlighten you ever so slightly. Hold on to your wallets. Um, so it, this is a card game um, in which basically you are a wizard, I believe it is, or, um, where you have a certain amount of life total, you have a deck full of cards and these are like creatures and spells and things like that and you fight against an opponent who also has a deck of creatures and spells and you're trying to lower each other's hit points to zero. Yeah, sound good? Um, it's a game that has um, been going for a very long time. Um, it's got an excellent rule set, at least it used to anyway. Um, and when I first started like gaming, in inverted commas, like tabletop gaming and stuff, Magic the Gathering was a really big part of it. Um, and it felt like it was its own world. Um, so I used to play in tournaments. I would draft every week. So drafting is where you get like, see the cards come in booster packs. So there'll be like 10 or it used to be 15. I don't know what it is anymore. I'm really out of my depth here. Um, in a little packet and you could open them up and tear them open. And there's a rare in the packet and their own commons and common cards. And the rares could be really good and do cool things. And now there's all sorts of things like mythics and whatnot beyond that. Um, but drafting was where you got three packs of cards and a group of you would sit down together, usually eight. And you'd pick a card from the booster and you would pass the rest of the cards to the person to your left. And and the person to your right would pass you their cards after picking one and you would continue this until you had enough cards to build a deck with and then you'd all play against each other with your decks um and i used to do an awful lot of this um so i suppose today you can play magic online i think there's an online version now um and things like that but it's always been a big part of the community somehow but it's got its own fringe thing i think magic players have a bit of a a bad reputation um not really surprised <laughs> but magic itself is a really fun game the reason why it's dangerous is because it's so easy to fall down that hole of i just need this other card i just need this other thing um and especially they've now done special stuff where there are alternative art cards and things of different rarities to encourage you to buy lots of it and it's fun buying and playing with lots of it. Um, that's the hard bit. So I used to play Magic a lot. Um, our house was infested with Magic cards. My husband used to run Magic events. Um, and I've done stuff like gone to Grand Prix. I've gone to the Pro Tour. They used to have big competitions and stuff like that. Um, I think they've kind of toned down on that these days. Um, but there was a point where we were like, we're going to have to just give this up. <laughs> um, it, was just a bit, it was just a bit too much and a bit silly. So we sold off all of our Magic cards and we turned our magic cards into board games see see where i'm going here so there was a story um but last week for the first time in i want to say like 10 years maybe uh, we played magic the gathering um and this is because there's a new set that just came out because they're forever bringing out new sets for you to spend your money on um and this is kind of like something called kamigawa neon and i know i started playing when kamigawa came out so there were cards so we were like oh look at the cards and the art let's do this for nostalgia's sake um so that's what the name of this was <laughs> was this is what we were calling it so i managed to get four of us together where we drafted and we got cards and we played with cards and I want to send the cards out of the house I don't want to keep them around here it's dangerous but I got to play magic and it's been a long time since I played it and gosh you know what it's very very smooth I think if you like card games that have very specific kind of rules and have so one thing that magic has that I think sometimes I see a lot in board games and I wish there was more of that which is timing right um that you need to know when something is going to happen. So, you know, in the board game, it would be like, get a free coin at the end of your turn. Cool, I know when that's supposed to happen. Um, and magic is really about stuff like that. Like this happened in this phase, this will happen now. Um, and it was just, you know what? It was, it was just, it hurt my brain. It's a serious puzzle playing against somebody else and trying to wrangle, you know, they're like, well, I play this now, I play this later. Like it is, a, it, it is definitely, um, a game of strategy but it's also incredibly pretty it's full of fun and whimsy I made sure to draft the cards that looked like dogs um, and you know what it was strange slipping back into that and it was also funny how well I remembered everything I suppose you know maybe those skills kind of don't really go away but I did manage to win our draft 
um, which was surprising because I think everyone else was also surprised um, that I know that sometimes I know what I'm doing and it looks like we're gonna do more drafts because we bought a box of boosters and we have to play our way through those um, but yeah I think like this I think magic is an awfully good game but it really draws you into something else or maybe that's just me maybe I'm just the type of person who wants to take it to the, to the next step or I find it very hard maybe to be casual about things and there are loads of casual ways to play magic nowadays as well you can play in groups you can play Melis, you can play EDH or Elder Dragon Highlander which is like a deck made of one of each you know type of card you put in you can't put multiples um, if you've ever thought about looking into it like I think you, maybe you could do it casually there's kind of different ways you can play magic nowadays but I'd love to know if any of you have played it before or have heard of it because I bet I bet it's pretty damn popular among board gamers or at least you know you maybe you'll know, have known or heard of it and if you do really like card games this is a really good one it might be worth just having a peek into it um, but yeah be careful it's kind of addictive and I can't believe I have to go back and play more games now I think I should just quit when I'm ahead because that would make loads of sense yeah and then I don't have to face the barrage that is kind of magic all over and I think mine just comes very weighted my magic comes with memories for me um and so maybe that's why I'm keeping a, a distance because um I know exactly where it might lead yeah keeping things simple over here board games people board games but then again this is good old games and you know magic is a game and it's pretty darn good Right, so, okay. <laughs> so what have you been playing? Because I've told you all of my been playing. Let's hear about it. And I'm going to pop into the personal bit section. I'll try and keep it short. I say this every time. I say I say this every time. Um, but yeah, I've had some really fun stuff happen this month. So maybe you want to hear about it. Um, so yeah, let's go. Okay, so I have an order of things in which I'm going to get to. So the first is going to be Batman, later games. What was the third one? Outdoor thing? Mm, okay, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Um, so the first thing is, um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but I was in the later games newsletter. Um, wow, what an achievement. That completely came out of nowhere and entirely blindsided me. Um, and you know what? Yeah, it was a bit, yeah, it, it was um, it's a bit upsetting, I suppose, because I get upset at good things. Um, but also I was amazed that somebody took the time to kind of call me out for something, which is uh, super cool. Um, if any of you have made it here um, via this newsletter, hello, thank you for popping in. Um, you have excellent taste. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think so anyway um so yeah so that was a super nice surprise um the other interesting thing that's happened to me this month um this is a really big deal actually um and not related to the channel at all it's to do with the new Batman movie don't know if any of you folks have seen it yet um it's called The Batman but um I so we, we haven't been to the cinema I think in absolutely ages my husband's a big Batman fan so inevitably we went to see Batman and we were so careful about it that like we went really early in the day. I think we went to those like a half 11 in the morning showing to Batman to make sure the cinema wouldn't be too busy or anything like that. Um, and gosh, I have to put this into words because I don't want to say the movie just blew me away because it wasn't just the movie. The, the movie made me feel something and I really wasn't sure what it was. Um, it's an achingly gorgeous, gorgeous movie. Like I was just, whew, yeah, it was brilliant. This Batman is much darker and grittier and, and might I say more emo than other um, Batmans before. And I love that. I love that this Batman is flawed. I love that they don't have everything worked out, that they're not perfect. They're, they're just a guy. This is very much a detective movie as opposed to a superhero movie. And I really appreciated that. Um, but mostly I just couldn't get over how it looked. I don't know if you've ever like gone to uh, an art museum or something like that and walked around and then gone home and there's one piece you just can't stop thinking about. Well, that's what happened. I couldn't stop thinking about the Batman movie. I came home and I thought about it and I thought and like I came home I listened to the soundtrack I looked up stuff about it online I just it made me it really did make me feel something and I was very determined to figure out what that something was um and for those of you who know me know I don't I don't leave my house very often um yeah I got issues that's fine 
um, but I really wanted to go back and see Batman. Um, and so for the first time, I think from forever, I did something on my own. I went back to the cinema to see Batman. Um, and on the second viewing, um, it was just as good as, just as good as the first, if not better. But I couldn't tell you the last time I was in the cinema on my own or the last time I spent money and things like that. It was all, it was all very like a lot. It was very anxious, but it was worth it to go back. And after I watched it for a second time, I, I still, I still, I still felt something. I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I came home and I was like I'm going to do a cinematography course I think I, I in my head I think it was just I needed to understand how it was made to how to like to see how pretty it was so that I could understand it somehow so yeah I did a cinematography course in a day I went and I listened to a bunch of interviews and things like that by the director of cinematography um I like <laughs> um I went and I I kind of I did a lot of research um so I went back for a third time to see Batman on my own all within a week which is huge for me absolutely huge and this time I got it I think I I just I finally saw what it was they were doing. It was like, you know, the man behind the curtain. I had to solve it. And I felt much better about it since. But I haven't stopped thinking about how it looked and how it was put together. And I really want my videos to have some more of that. So I'm on a big cinematography kick right now. So I'm trying something different out today. I have a second camera recording. If it doesn't look absolutely terribly awful, I'll try and put put it in here a bit but I'm working on lighting and stuff like that um in a way I haven't tackled things in a while but I just I think it was I think I was just amazed that I felt so strongly about something it was very very odd it was a <laughs> great movie well worth watching very long movie like three hours long so prepare yourselves um but it was just yeah it was just a strange feeling to be so caught up in something or to feel so affected by something. Um, I don't know if that happens to other people very often. It didn't, it hasn't happened to me very often. So I kind of went rolling with it. So now I'm like in the process of trying to um, watch more films and things like that to, I suppose, get inspiration and ideas. I'm not sure how long this will last, but I'm gonna roll with it. Um, so yeah, so that was my big excitement. Um, <laughs> big excitement of the month was the Batman movie. <laughs> so, 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 so good. Um, and then I suppose I'll chunk in the final thing because as most of you know I've been taking photos um, when I leave, I leave the, leave, I'm back to leaving the house problems yeah this is what I have one day a week we go to the beach or the woods or something like that we go kind of I call it exploring but we kind of know where we're going in, in West Cork here in Ireland and I do my best to take photos because it's a good excuse to use my camera and lens for things um, and create photography and stuff like that. And I post my pictures on both my Facebook page now and uh, my tw on, on Twitter. I have a, usually just like a thread of here are photos if anyone wants to check those out. And um, some people seem to be enjoying them. Um, but I managed to go into the water, kind of like a, a swim, not quite a swim, almost a swim at the beach this week, which is a really big deal for me. Again, I seem to have a couple of big steps this month um but I just every time I go to the beach I wish I could go for a swim I don't know if anyone else ever feels this kind of stuff but as a kid some of my best memories are at the seaside and of swimming and things like that so every time we go I'm like god it would be lovely to just you know to to go in um and I never really managed it um so this month I like I I don't know I readied myself and I bought myself a swimsuit which was the first big hurdle. And then the second step was I actually got into the water at the weekend. Now, I didn't get all the way down for a swim yet. It was a little bit wavy, I think. And, I, and it's been so long since I swam or I was in the water. Um, it was, I was like, I'm not gonna push myself and get myself taken out to see her um, um, <laughs> what whatnot. But it was amazing. Um, and I'm really, really glad that I did it. And sure, yeah, I felt a bit silly. Um, like I am way too old to be sitting, you know, in the edge of the surf kind of thing. Um, but I'm glad. I'm glad I did it. It was um it was really nice. Like I got out of the ocean and I felt very refreshed. It was lovely. So I'm looking forward to trying that again soon. Um and re recapturing a little bit of that kind of niceness. Um, the problem, of course, now is I have to kind of wait a week before we go again. Like, that's a bit lame. <laughs> so here, here we are recording videos and things instead. 
but then otherwise yeah like channel stuff is going good there are new games arriving so there'll be new reviews coming soon um i kind of like this pace i'm at at the moment where i do the monthly roundup and i do the one review um that's good maybe that will change over time but i'm not entirely certain um i wonder will this look different than last month's video um i hope it does i'm trying out a couple of different things so if there's any comments on that or anything i could do to improve um i'd really like to hear i'd really like to hear it yeah just be nice because i'm horribly sensitive um, <laughs> so yeah so that should be everything for this video um yeah thanks for choosing tuning in there were some cr crackingly good games this month um god i can only hope the next month is half as fruitful um but if not you know there'll still be plenty of things to talk about right so thanks everybody for listening tune in again soon like subscribe if you want to hear about board games yada 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 and until next time everybody i'm wishing you a wonderful month take care everybody Bye bye